junior officers now, they have come here to learn how to fly. Well, today we're going to cover some of the material that's covered in Tech 2. The art and science of flying military jet aircraft um, has become so demandingly intricate that it will take them a year to learn engine, just the basics. The Viper 102 engine. Among those who've made it this far, John McRae, ex-milkman. Trevor Lewis, ex-electrical fitter, an airman up from the ranks. As is Martin Oxborough, ex-armorer, Alistair Stewart, zoologist, and the man who's given up a career as a nurse, Robbie Lowe. Later versions, the 600, in fact, power the Dominic. Uh, pull it apart and just fold it in there and roll it on. It'll be four weeks before they get inside an aircraft. First, they get familiar with the drill and the dress of the modern fighter pilot. The bone dome, as the helmet is called, is tailored to fit at 250 pounds a head. Torn in both ears? The bone dome is more than a headdress. A pilot who has to eject at 600 miles an hour will not live without it. Continuity is good. That's fine. Magic. We've talked about the problems of the ejection seat and what it needs to do to help you survive, but of course its limitations are, as we discovered, injuries to the man sitting on it. In other words, you can't give it such a punch that it makes you a blob of jelly on the seat. You've got to be able to use it and survive, and of course, in the RAF purpose, survive to fight another day. So when you pull that handle, get your head back, arms in, and wait and see what happens. word of command will be eject. Now when I say eject, I mean eject, not just flop out. A good pull. But don't fetch your head forward. Keep it back all the time. Now on this particular seat, you will not rise straight away. You've got a second delay to get rid of your canopy. Now you chaps do tend, after you know pulling the handle, you do tend to look down thinking you haven't fired. And then the seat goes off and you'll get it right in the neck. So keep your head back. All right, now you understand that. Prepare to eject. Eject! On the word of command, prepare to eject. Eject! This is a gentle eject. simulation. The real thing, even if they get it right, will put them in hospital for up to four weeks with spinal compression. We will put you in the chamber and we'll start off at 25,000 feet. And in three seconds, I will rapidly decompress you to 45,000 feet. If you like, that might make your eyes water a little. 
In the decompression chamber, they're about to discover how it feels to bail out into freezing thin air you know, at 25,000 feet. If you decompress a gas, in other words, reduce its pressure, its volume will increase. So the gases that are in your body and in the cavities in your body are going to expand if I decompress you. And of course, the greater the altitude I decompress you to, the greater the, the increase in the volume of the gas. So your problems could be, where is that bubble of gas? Now, of course, you might say, well, if it's in your mouth, fine, because you just breathe out. But there are plenty of cavities in your body that have a rather small opening, a rather narrow aperture, and it can't get out too quickly sometimes. And of course, therefore, it may cause you pain. So let's look at the areas of the body that you could expect pain, discomfort, or at least some sort of a problem. You have a stomach which has an opening to the mouth, so all you need to do is burp it up. Now, there's no need to be polite in the chamber. If you feel gas and a pressure in your stomach, just burp it up. You don't have to switch your microphone on there for we can't hear you, so nobody's very bothered about it. And of course the same goes for the large gut. Again, it has a large opening to the outside. No need for me to tell you where. So if you have discomfort in the back passage, in other words, if you have a lot of gas in the rectum, then you just get rid of it. Again, we've all got masks on, we're all breathing 100% oxygen, so nobody's going to suffer from any problem, except you if you hang on to it. You might have some pain. Right, well, as I said before, when we just did that briefing, all we're doing now is a nice slow climb up to 8,000 feet. And we're going about 4,000 feet a minute. Nothing much to feel. Uh, you feel a little hissing, bubbling, squeaking in your ears, perhaps. And you can hear the hissing going in the chamber. That's quite normal. You might feel a little bit of gut expansion. Uh, so just, as I said, get rid of it, either up the way or down the way, as you feel the need. Now, when we get to 8,000 feet, what we're going to do is have a pause. We're going to do some more briefing and we'll hear some checks going on. Then we'll do this uh, rapid decompression. All you'll hear is the corporal counting out 54321 now. Then comes a clang as he pulls a valve outside. There'll be a bit of gut expansion again. Some misting up, it'll get a bit chilly and a bit noisy. And that'll be about it. RD checks. And all valves are closed. You are clear to RD on instructions from the doctor. All right, any, any questions? Nothing to it, just sit back and enjoy the trip. Okay, when you're ready, Corporal. Right then, sir. Decompressing in five, four, three, two, one, now. <laughs> Right, and we're there. That's all there is to it. You probably noticed that pressure in the back. Five seconds. Look at all the steam. Well, you can all just now look at your regulator. Look Ten at the seconds. regulator you're using. Make sure it's switched on, obviously. That your contents are between Fifteen two and three. Seconds. That's the one on the wall behind you, number eight. Right. Lack no of problems. oxygen gives them their first undiluted taste of rarefied air. The sensation is one of being pleasantly drunk, but it's a dangerous euphoria that can destroy judgment. It's essential that they're able to identify the symptoms. Okay, now when you feel symptoms or anything you feel at all, I want you to write them down the right hand side, okay? But underneath your name and address, let's start with 100 and go backwards. 100, 99, 98. And keep going. What does he feel over here? A bit lightheaded. Then he should be, his breathing rate is faster. So he's got a symptom of hyperventilation caused by hypoxia. <laughs> weeks of emergency drill and technical SWAT, preparing for the worst. They have to learn how to stay afloat before they can go aloft. But each day takes them closer to the cockpit. Mission switch on, cockpit lights on. But they're not there yet. This is an earthbound model. They have to memorize perfectly 180 individual checkpoints before they move on to the real thing. And then it automatically switches back and plays back from the tower. Yeah. 
This was to have been their first day in a real plane, their first day of flying. But a foggy day in the Vale of York has grounded everything. No flying today. Instead, a practical lesson in visibility and a chance to reflect that Linton on Ooze, where fogs are frequent, is an odd place to have a flying school. Flight Lieutenant Mike Jameson, QFI, qualified flying instructor, and Martin Oxborough. They're at the beginning of a very special relationship. Jameson, who flew Canberra's for five years, has to take Oxborough from raw novice to solo flyer in just 14 hours of flying time. You've got to form a relationship with the student, and it very much depends on the instructor. If the instructor can make the student feel at ease, then the student, I think, will be more receptive to instruction. There, there comes a point, obviously, where you can't be too, too easy going. You can't be too easy going with the student. Otherwise, he won't respect you as an instructor. He's, you, you've got to make him feel that you are human. You've done the course. And that's the other thing that you've got to impress on these guys, that we've all done the same course. We were all in their position, and we know exactly what it was like. And we know or what it is like, and we know what they're going through now. And what you try and do is you strike up a relationship with the student, trying to put him at ease. Uh, if you can put the guy at ease, then he's probably more likely to assimilate what you've taught him. Somebody who shouts at the student, who doesn't make them feel at ease in the cockpit, probably won't achieve the same, same aims. I'm sure there are a few people who join the RAF thinking that being a pilot is an easy way of life. And pilots tend to be uh, glamorized, certainly civilian pilots are. I mean, they work very, very hard. Uh, they do go through a lot of training, the same as our guys do as well. It's a more demanding job being a military pilot because you don't wear a nice charcoal gray suit and shirt sleeves you invariably wear a flying suit, which is a bit hot to wear. It's uncomfortable. And you have to sit in a cockpit strapped in fairly tightly as well. It's like being trussed up like, you know, like a chicken. You have an oxygen mask on your face. That can be a bit uncomfortable as well. Uh, it gets very hot, very, very sweaty. And you've still got to work in this environment. You have a bone dome on your head, which is quite heavy at times as well. You're pulling G. That's very tiring, very, very tiring. And you come back at the end of an hour sortie, and you're absolutely shattered. You really are. If you've put everything into it, or you've put a lot of work into it, you come back absolutely shattered, you really do. Now we've got the right speed, right height, lovely stuff. There you are, is it trimmed out? Not quite so Well, yeah. should have been. Yeah. You've had half an hour. That's it. See, why make things difficult? You've been sitting there. Why hold? No, it's not, is it? No. Right. Well, come on, turn it out. Makes it easier. No wonder we're climbing. Well, no, just don't sort about with that. Let's get the height right. Not 1,300 feet. Come on. And if you throw, put the nose down, its speed will increase. What about doing this? Look, watch this. This is magic. All right, now we've got stacks of time. We can have a good long run. Nice big dam busters raid run at the downwind leg, look. Sort ourselves out from down here. What's that three eight? Final three green. Roll three eight. Roll three eight. What are you putting power on for? You're not, you're not looking at the right things. I mean, Christ, that's an airspeed indicator. It tells you how fast you're going. All right? On the last 300 feet, if you want to go faster, you move this thing. It's not the armrest, it's the throttle. Sure. All right? Move it. Our control. Yeah, control. Sir. Right, this will not do. Now, come on, where are we going? Can't land on the green stuff. Come on, I want those lines underneath your backside. You're making some stupid mistakes. You can't, I'm sorry, but you know, we're, we're both going to be sitting in that aircraft there on the concrete short of the runway. All right? Sir. Will not do. You're just not listening at all. Now, think. 
Just think about it, just relax a little bit, all right? Don't get so tense. After seven hours of flying, Oxborough has come through his first big test. He's landed the Provost unaided. Oh, Christ, that's better. How are you feeling? <laughs> a bit sweaty, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so I should think so as well. <laughs> well. You can tell them all we've done a landing now, anyway, <laughs> which is something. Yeah. It was a good trip, actually. He worked very, very hard at the beginning of it. He had to achieve the different attitudes to maintain the speed, and he flew it very, very accurately. I was very impressed. Yeah, Unfortunately, of course, that's the easier part of the, the sortie. The nitty-gritty comes in when you've got to get down towards the ground. So you know what the airfield looks like now from about five feet. <laughs> That's called sneaking up and surprising gonna... it. <laughs> yes. I thought I was going to see what it was like from underneath at five feet. Well, not quite, not quite. <laughs> Actually, there must have been. Did you not see those pylons on the way in? Yes. Yes, I, I wondered whether or not you <laughs> That had. was when you said you were a little bit low. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, well, that's, I was just being diplomatic. Yes. <laughs> we did a couple of demos. We had to go out to the low flying area because, unfortunately, there was somebody in the circuit with a problem. So uh, we attacked a bunch of trees out in the, out in the middle of nowhere which uh, I think upset a few people because uh, there were cars beginning to gather and people looking up at us uh, at chapel hat pegs. And uh, that was okay, that worked out quite nicely. And then we came back in and, and had a go at the runway. There was a little bit of crosswind which made it a little bit tricky for him so we couldn't line ourselves up directly with the runway. Um, so we were offset slightly into wind. But it worked very nicely. Um, he appreciated what the runway should look like at the correct approach path, or on the correct approach path, and uh, I did the roller, showed him the, the bit from 300 feet downwards, and then we went down again, talked about it downwind, and then came in, and the final landing was his. It was a little bit tense, in fact. Uh, I, had to, uh, I had to sort of fight him on the controls a little bit, because I could feel him really holding them quite stiffly. And it just fear, really, of the, of the ground coming up to meet the aircraft, but uh, having seen that it's quite easy to do, he then had to go himself and he had no problems, and I thought it was great. And he was chuffed to bits, actually, he really was. So uh, I let him slow it down on the runway. I didn't want to take control immediately because uh, otherwise, you know, um, it would have defeated the object. I wanted him to actually land the aircraft and bring the speed under control, um, which he did, and then once it was safely under control, I then just, just took control and uh, taxied off and brought it back. So... Uh, and then he did, uh, once he'd composed himself again, he uh, then did the final shutdown checks and all the rest of it. So I was very impressed. I feel terrific now. That is, that is the best moment I've ever had out there. Halfway down the runway. When we hadn't actually hit the concrete, we'd landed on it and we didn't bounce and we didn't do anything else. And <laughs> Floods and Jameson had to take over. Because <laughs> I was so elated, I just wanted to scream. <laughs> I still do now. <laughs> That's magic. I never thought I said to her, actually. Uh, that I was concentrating so hard, I didn't realise uh, that it was me, if you see. I mean, I was landing it, and we touched down, and we hadn't bounced, and we're going down a runway, and I thought, oh, what about braking? We've got to slow down or something. <laughs> so he said, I have control. And I said, you have control, sir. And he said, what's the matter? I, I just couldn't say anything. I was lost for words, because it, it was magic. Magic. And I'd brought it all the way down, yeah. Never thought I could do it. Got to improve on it now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it felt magic, yeah. Superb.
It's a good summer, clear skies nearly every day. The class of 79 is pushing on fast. They're reaching towards a supreme moment, the day they fly solo. Well, uh, we came down from Linton this morning, um, hoping to get some circuits in, but uh, even though it's a nice day, there's very, it's a very poor horizon at 1,000 feet. And as we are working up to them, very close to letting some of the guys go solo, it's very unfair to let them fly in these conditions, because really they need a good horizon in order to uh, kamikaze their way around. But uh, as you can see, there's two people flying in the circuit at the moment, but they're probably more advanced students who can uh, fly the whole lot on instruments because they can't see much else. You can see the ground all right, but you just can't see anyone else in the circuit, which is unfortunate. Tell me how important the solo stage is to them. Well, if they don't go solo, they don't go any further on the course, as simple as that. Uh, they're suspended. It's a big psychological boost for them to go solo. It really is. Um, they now feel that they have mastered that aircraft and they can fly it around on their own, albeit just around the circuit. The most dangerous part of flying is landing. When they've made three safe landings with the instructor alongside, they're considered ready for a solo flight. You've got to use your own judgment. The whole thing is about using judgment when you're going to send a guy off solo. Basically, you've got to decide whether or not the guy can manage it on his own. It's very nerve-wracking because obviously you, uh, you don't want him to make a mistake. When it comes to sending the guy solo, there are, there are certain things that you have to think about. Obviously, is the guy safe enough to do it? The main thing that you're thinking about is, have I told him everything that he needs to know to go around this circuit on his own? What you will do is you'll brief him as to what he's going to do, exactly what he's going to do. In other words, you normally tell him to wait until you're in the control tower. Uh, you tell him that you're there at the end of the, the radio. Should anything go wrong, He's got your friendly or unfriendly voice, depending on how panicky you both are at the time. He's got your voice at the end of a microphone, so he can talk to you, uh, which will probably be the same as if you were sitting next to him, because it's a voice in his ear. You've got to cover the aspects of should anything go wrong, the emergencies. Uh, if he loses an engine, can he cope with it, or is he just going to start panicking and then eventually crash? And basically, what you tell him there is that He's got to make the decision early to eject. Not that you're too fussed about losing the aircraft. You are very fussed about losing him. We can always get another aircraft. I don't think we've ever had a student, not since I've been at Linton anyway, who's crashed on his first solo. Yes, you do get very apprehensive because it's, uh, it's a, it's a very strange feeling to describe, really. It's like a bird going out of the nest for the first time. But it, it's an achievement for you to see a guy who has arrived probably not having done any flying before, and there he is off on his own in an aircraft, a jet aircraft as well. And it is, it's, an, it's a, a great achievement, and you just hope that it goes OK. Oh, Christ. Ricocheting down the centre line again. That's about the best takeoff he's done. <laughs> nice, put the nose down again. Oh my goodness me! Oh, what a twit! I told him so many times. Spacing looks about right. That's the easy bit. Oh, 
in front. Put it on. Great. Guys. Landing, land, no, it, well, Christ, what do you expect? Now we have the uh, the divvy dancing all the way down the centre line there. That's all right, he's on the ground, that's the main thing, good. I don't think I've ever sweated so much in my life, actually. Mm. I was petrified, Colin. I don't mind saying. <laughs> I saw that runway coming up, and I thought, Jesus, this is the moment <laughs> we've all been Do waiting. it this time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really enjoyed it, actually. It's a stupid thing to say. I was oh, petrified yeah. at the beginning of the runway. Yeah. Oh, and all these things, I get all these. I could, hear, I could hear you in Mike Jameson in the back of my mind going, I give a shake, you know, and all these sort of different things are going through my mind. <laughs> Bloody hell. That's magic. What's wrong with the flaps, then? <laughs> How do you feel? Well done. I need a coffee. <laughs> Thanks very much, sir. <laughs> hey, <laughs> what? Where's Martin? Yes, please. Oh, he did come into the bar. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Martin Oxborough. A week later, They've all made that first great leap into the sky. They've all gone solo. Now they can celebrate with the traditional rites. But not for long. They have 14 hours of flying behind them. Another 146 hours to go before they finish here. That is for the ones who last the course. Not all of them will. Right. John McRae. Who's he? Uh, JP's a bit faster than you, Morgan. Well done. Come on. Come on.